Good day, fellow investors. I'm very privileged today to be here with Perry Enster in his beautiful villa in Portugal, Sintra, to discuss about how to invest in stocks because he has been a consultant, business consultant for more than 40 years, professor of strategy, and everything evolves around finding great, great businesses when it comes to investing. And I'm so happy to discuss this with Per, and thank you, Per, for doing this. It's a pleasure. So let me start by introducing Perry Enster. He is an academic, entrepreneur, investor, businessman, consultant. So he started his academic career as a Fulbright scholar at the Pittsburgh Univers University, then started as a professor at Virginia, then followed by IMD Business School, then was the dean of the Copenhagen Business School, and then at the China International Business School in Shanghai. Yep. Alongside that, part with because academics is best when it's practical, you also had your consulting business where you consulted dozens of businesses among uh, IBM, Philips, Unilever. So you always did that. And the third pillar of your career has been investing in startups and bigger businesses that actually are now also you invest in shares through the fund that you set up. So a very broad perspective on investing, on businesses, on academia. And uh, let's cut the chase and let me start with the questions. So please bear, tell us when you invest in a business, in a stock, what is the core? What are you looking at? I, I think we always look um, after a business that has a clear strategy. Um, and what does that mean? Well, I think a strategy needs to be a con con concise um, concept uh, focused on the market uh, with uh, products that are obviously um, unique uh, or can differentiate itself from, from competition. We're looking at businesses that, that it's not easy to get into because if it, there are barriers to entry, you know, if it is profitable, you will always see more competitors come in and, and try to steal away your, your gains. We're also looking for com uh, um, companies where you don't have too many competitors and preferably no competitors. And they don't necessarily need to be big businesses. I mean, there are many uh, smaller businesses that either geographically or in a specific industry can be really, really unique. And so even their small size, they may actually have either the whole market or you know, 70, 80%. And generally when, when you have that kind of a market share, as my good friend Jack Welch once said, um, one and two will do, three and four out the door. You, you, when, when you dominate a segment, you, you control profitability, you can better cater to uh, customers, and you have economies of scale, even at smaller sizes. In fact, most niches that, that are dominated by one person is actually a niche because there were only room for one company that can actually be at minimum efficient scale. So the uniqueness of these businesses is, I think, something that is uh, very common because um, if you have a, a, a good customer base and there's demand that outstrips supply, you will make money. Yeah. Okay. So that's the kind of businesses, whether it's in, in private or in, 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 in listed companies, those are the kind of businesses I always try to look for because they tend to be much more profitable than the average um, uh, average company out there. And do you prefer smaller businesses or do you also like uh, in your fund when you <coughs> buy stocks and shares, do you also like to buy big businesses or just small or medium? Uh? All right, so, so you mentioned the fund. So um, uh, six years ago, um, um, my partner through 30 years, he used to be a, a student of mine at IMD, been working with me in my consulting company for all these years. We decided actually that we wanted to to create a fund because we felt that many of the funds that you can uh, invest in if you go to your local bank or whatever, um, they actually don't really have a strategy. I mean, they will be sort of the top uh, Europe top 50 or it will be Asian uh, growth stocks, etc. In my book, that those are not strategies. I mean, they, it's not that it's bad because if you are a very large fund, you maybe want to have some sector diversification or geographical diversification but in my book that can never really achieve high yields yeah. so what we decided to do actually um, given the fact that we had um, you know 30 40 years of, of 
experience in helping companies become more profitable than their competitors was to actually find companies that had those special characteristics and then invest in it. Because uh, we felt there were really not anything available on the market. That, that's not, it's not completely true because there are funds out there managed by managers that follow a very similar strategy to ours and what you, and what you, um, uh, you talk about in your, on your video channel, uh, classic value investing. But they also understand that you need to find those unique gems. But many of these funds are actually not available. I mean, first of all, you need to have you know, 1 million or 10 million or 100 million dollars to be part of, of that group of, of, uh, uh, of investors, uh, or they are not available. And frankly, also, we, we were looking a little bit at the cost, and we, we said, we think we can do this better. So we literally have created a fund for what we call friends, fools, and family. Um, and, and we've been very successful so far. Uh, but those companies we invest in <coughs> are the classic companies that I'm talking about. It is, in our case now, listed companies. So they need to be listed on the stock exchange. They are small to medium-sized companies. And, and why do we do that? Because small to medium-sized companies, if you track it hi historically, and this is where the academic side of us yeah. come in, are so much more profitable than if you uh, invest in large caps. Yeah. Um, so we go for small and medium-sized companies, and we go for companies that are exposed to growth. It can either be in, in an industry, or it can be in a geographical area. So my own preference is uh, Asia, and I think you also have mentioned that yeah. on some of your videos. And why? Because there's a lot of um, people out there. There are lots of growth compared to Europe, which yeah, is yeah. Uh, anemic. And then finally, we do classic value investing, meaning you know we always go in and invest in in good value where there's a wide um, uh, there's a, a wide uh, 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 you know upside to it where where we where there's a the the, the, the margin of, of safety is very big. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so these are the, the sort of the classic elements of the kind of things we we, we invest in, um, and then we have sort of a, a strategic mentor that we basically look for, that, that these companies have to qualify for. Again, as I said before, is there a barrier to entry? Do they have a lot of competition? Um, are their products different? You know, what about consumers? Do they have a lot of options uh, at choosing? And oftentimes, um, uh, we try to actually avoid co um, companies with too much fixed capital. And that, of course, is something to do with how you weather, um, you know, um, Cycli cyclicality, yeah. etc. So all our stocks have to sort of, you know, go through that Mensa and be checked out in order to see whether they have strategic viability according to our, our criteria. And and that is an exercise that, that uh, I think is useful. Well, you uh, you are investing in a in a in a private venture or whether you're investing in stocks uh, in shares. Um, uh, as an individual, all but you like us uh, are having a, a fun to do it. And something special that you always talk about how even if you invest just in stocks, you always like to go and meet the management and check the company <coughs> personally. Yeah. So I think that comes from your uh, also investing in startups and uh, that later many way, way went public. It, it, it does. It also comes from my academic work. I've always uh, like to actually, uh, even when uh, I was teaching executives, etc., to bring in cases into the classroom where I had actually been with the senior management. You, you get a sense of them because you you want to you want to invest in companies where you have good quality managers and they don't do stupid things okay, just yeah. because they're sitting on a pile of cash going out and buying something because they want to become bigger and and etc. You want really to have an understanding on of of of, uh, uh, of management teams, you know, they create that stability. Yeah. You know, I'm at an age now where I don't like to go out and, and buy a lot of green bananas. I like to have proven results, yeah. and that sometimes make it a little bit boring. You know, so I don't know anything about Bitcoin, and I'm I, I don't think I will ever get into that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. I I like proven concepts. You know, companies that have shown again and again that they can deliver, they can deliver growth, they, they're, obviously the customers are happy. Mm -hmm. 
you know, employees uh, work hard and, and they deliver earnings growth year after year. Yeah. Those are the kind of companies that I personally like to invest in. And some people may find them a little boring. Uh, I rather want to ha pay a higher price in terms of a PE because um, people often forget that even companies that have a, a slightly higher PE, if they're really profitable, people forget that the earnings actually get invested, but not at the, the PE rate, at the yeah, yeah, yeah. one to one rate. And, and so over time, you will, have, you will have shares that are just gonna become more and more valuable. So what you paid uh, you know, in 10 years time, 20 years time is actually gonna be almost uh, irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that's what we are, uh, like to go for. So now that I hear this, that's very similar also, Munger says, re return on invested capital from the company. But a question now from the whole perspective on, of the industry, why is 99% of people <coughs> chasing after index funds while history, academia, successful investors, value investors have shown over and over again through time that these are the simple principles the, that work? Um, well, um, I think I have a, a, a dual sort of relationship to index funds because it is true that in the, in, in the world of, of fund, and fund management, um, fees are high and, and sometimes often too high. <clears throat> and it's where sort of the investors are, are bearing the, the brunt of yeah. the risk and, and the cost and the managers are basically just plucking the grapes no matter what happens. So index funds have a role in the sense that they are very they're very cost effective, and it's also true that they have actually managed to do fairly well uh, uh, over the past 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and and that pop uh, with with that uh, success has also come their popularity. So it ha they right now have a little bit the characteristics of one of these sort of multi marketing schemes. Uh, where, where more and more people pile in and the more and more money there is. And of course, they are all buying almost the same sh shares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, that is, of course, giving them a self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. until, my friend, the market turns. Okay. Because as uh, retail investors then become uh, scared and want to get out, of course, the funds need to sell the same shares. Yeah. So just as they have been very successful in building up, uh, you know, "Quote unquote performance," um, they are they are also gonna uh, suffer the the brunt when when everybody wants yeah. to pile for the exit, and I think I think that's the difference uh, with the way I think about investing is I don't really like to think about buying shares I I buy I buy companies, yeah. and so that's why it's not that different whether you invest in a small to medium size uh, you know um, company or startup even a startup, and, and invest in uh, the shares of a uh, of a listed company. Now, I have to also warn, warn uh, your, your audience that small and me medium-sized companies also have a negative size to it. And that is that they're often very thinly traded. Yeah. And that means also because they're thinly traded, if you want to get out, you often have, often have to suffer uh, price decline, particularly if you, you, you do it in one go. Yeah. Because they, the, the, they're thinly traded and, and the spreads between buy and sell, often very large. So that's why, for instance, in our fund, we don't trade that much. I mean, we, we, we trade when some of our successful shares basically hit, hit the upper limit of how, much, how many shares of that stock we are allowed to have. Yeah, yeah. And my, my, my great partner, Peter Barkling, always cries when he had to sell some of his darlings. <laughs> but, but then at the same time, uh, also, when, when, when we then see that they have, have become uh, maybe uh, less pricey, we will also go in and, and buy some of them again if, if there's room for us. So, but we are very careful about trading because I think uh, some people are day traders and I know very little about that and yeah. some people seem to be very successful with it. But that's not uh, us. We, we invest in companies and we invest in companies with a very clear strategic focus. And I think everybody should look for that. And Sometimes you can, obviously you need to do your financials and your channel is very good at discussing that. But I think the financials only show you um, what the company has been doing in, uh, so far uh, in monetary terms. 
you need to go beyond and saying, what was it that actually created that financial structure, you know, uh, in terms of product, market, etc. Uh, and then you need to go back actually and look even further into the kind of organization, its history, its management team, yeah. in order to get a very clear understanding of whether, whether this thing is also going to be viable in the future, 5, 10, 15 years from now. And um, many investors don't want to do that work. And that's why I actually have appreciate uh, people like yourself who not only uh, teach uh, the, uh, the people who follow you about the kind of depth that needs to go into considering these shares rather than just buying it because oh it has a low PE let me just buy it yeah. <clears throat> you need to do the work and that's why also I think your your platform is a is a great source for people who are interested in that to go in there and, and get more in-depth information usually that you can get from your, your stockbroker or, or, or from the bank that you're maybe dealing through. Thank you, thank you. So, so that's also the business side, the, quali the qualitative that explains the numbers is also a reason why I applied for an internship at Pairs Fund. Wow. So I hope to get that internship <laughs> so that I can increase the value of uh, YouTube, an internship, all that I get is I work, I hope I can help them a little bit with digging deeper and uh, I hope to get back the knowledge and share that knowledge also on uh, this YouTube channel. So I hope to see much more of pair on of this YouTube channel. Of course, your partner, Peter Barklin, and also present some, I hope they will give me their analysis of stocks that I can make videos and increase the value of this YouTube for you as a viewer and for the whole investing community that likes this. Okay, we are not investing in shares, stocks, we are investing in businesses, quality businesses, yeah. people, management, uh, to, let's say, help us financially in the long term. And, uh, well, I'm not sure how much uh, we, we can teach you, but uh, I think it is so important that people, put, particularly now where we, we have a lot of flurry on the market, mm -hmm. okay, and people are very nervous, and in fact, you know, old friends of mine suddenly show up and saying, gee golly, I'm, I'm down 30%. <laughs> Can you help me now? <laughs> well, I wish you had talked with me a little bit earlier. But, but, uh, but particularly in these times, it's important to understand, you know, yes, there's maybe a, a repricing going on in the market right now, but, but the companies you should have invested in, if they are healthy, etc. I'm not concerned. Yeah. You know, because, and I think this is the difference, if people just start focusing on the daily value of their shares, mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to compare myself in any way to Warren Buffett and, and, and Charlie Munger, despite the fact we also play the ukulele. <laughs> but but I, I, I really want people to understand that they need to get away from this, you know, just looking at a stock market and the talking faces on the, on the television. But they need to actually spend the time, as I think you so well um, are advocating um, on your channel, to really find out where you don't need a lot of shares, you, you need some good ones, and you, you really should get some good ones that you can just keep and hold on to. Yeah. Um, so in our fund, we have, uh, I think now, about 24, 25 shares, okay? We don't want many more, okay? Uh, if it goes below 15, um, I, I don't think I'm diversified enough in the fund. Yeah. And even the fund, to me, is, we have a very clear focus, small and medium-sized companies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in my own portfolio, uh, so I have a lot of money in my, uh, the investment fund, um, but I also have my own portfolio that where I diversified in different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For instance, I just um, uh, got out of a very large business in China. And before, I didn't want to have any more in China because there was too much. So the last... Um, last couple of months, I'm now looking at specific China-based companies. Mm -hmm. And also, as we talked about earlier in, in uh, other just, emerging just markets. Just to say, you, you didn't sell stocks of the business in China. That was a private venture. Oh, it was, a, it was a private venture. It was a very, very large project uh, involving real estate and et cetera in, 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 in Sichuan province in China uh, that I've been working on for uh, eight years. Um, and, and getting out of that, uh, you know, freed up not only some cash, but it also freed up, shall we say, the diversification yeah, opportunities yeah, yeah. for China. And, and I have always had uh, a lot in real estate. Now I'm out of that real estate 
which means I can now rebalance my portfolio with real estate in other areas, for instance. Uh, or, as you also say, you want to have some commodities, you want to have some you know, uh, diversification between industrial and consumers, etc., and financials. And, and I think everybody has to think in those terms. Uh, even if you have a little money and you have big money, you need to sort of think about this. And it doesn't take place overnight or just because you're meeting with your local bank advisor, yeah. which you may not want to do. Uh, <laughs> They're like used car salesmen. <laughs> so so I, I really, um, uh, and this is also why I originally contacted you, because I think you're doing a great job and a great service that <clears throat> is not very common. You don't generally find it on, on sort of C, CNBC and CNN and Bloomberg. Um, you, you, you don't find people that actually are willing to stand up and, and in a rigorous way go through and explain these things for, for the public. Um, and, and some of your viewers, I'm sure, don't have too much money. And I'm sure that some of them actually have a lot of money. And they, you help everybody sort of understand and get on track in terms of these, I think, very valuable insights. It's not my insights. I mean, <clears throat> Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, of course, are some of the biggest proponents of this way of thinking. Um, and it's not unique. It's not difficult if you are just willing to take the time yeah. to both learn about it, but also go through the analysis. And this is where I think the, the service of the channel is, uh, uh, is terrific and must be uh, commended. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, let me just finish with, uh, now we are, in, many say, late part of the economic cycle. Uh, when you go back <laughs> in your long career, more than 40 years, how do you compare this period with something that happened or in the past, or isn't it comparable? Um, I think there are, there are a few things that are different. First of all, the access to information is very different today. Um, I can pick up the telephone now to my broker in, in Singapore and within half an hour he will have um, uh, three or four analyst reports on a, maybe a Chinese uh, company that I'm interested in. Yeah. I mean, that is just unthinkable in the old days. And so, so the access to information... now you have to realize everybody has that access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why it's, you also have to be able to sort out what is, uh, uh, as we say in Denmark, shit or Chanel. Yeah. You know, you, be, you need to be able to understand, you know, there's a lot of noise out there. Uh, and it can oftentimes be confusing for, for particular inexperienced investors to not just listen to hype or whatever goes on because there's also a lot of fake information out there or, or misinformation mm -hmm. and and popular, populist information. Yeah. Uh, so that's also one of the reasons why, for instance, I like to go down and see the companies, or see, uh, go to the companies and see the companies we invest in. Not that the personal meetings always can reveal everything, but sometimes, you know, you, you find information in saying, gee, God, nobody really actually knew about this. And uh, you can see on their faces if some of the information they have been you know, posting in the public, maybe now it's completely true, etc. And I think this is very important, particularly when you invest your own, but also other people's money, that you have that sort of sanity check uh, on, on how you do it. Um, what else is also investing? Uh, for me personally also, I, I, I of course learn. Yeah. And I think this is another thing that, that uh, your, your, uh, the people who follow you need to understand is, is that over time you become better and better and better. It's the same thing with entrepreneurs. I, I always tell the entrepreneurs of my own students, etc. Um, electing an entrepreneurial career path is a learning process. Yeah. You never get it right first. You're going to make mistakes. You're probably going to, you know, uh, if not go bankrupt, but certainly have to fold your company, you know, a few times. And in fact, I think that the, the people who have done it a few times are actually the best entrepreneurs because they, they have been down. They know what the bottom of the... Of, of, of the, uh, the, the bank account look like. <laughs> and I think it's very healthy. It gives you humility. Right. And, and I think you need humility if you want to learn so that every new day is a new opportunity to find insights you didn't have before. And, and to me, this is very important. And, and again, I said, I think your channel is a very good impetus for people to, to log in and say, well, gee golly, I never thought about that. Yeah. You know? 
oh wow this kind of company i i, I actually never understood like you had a very good uh, discussion on copper you know I, I think it's very nice for people to be able to go to a place like this and 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 ha and uh, and have that be a start of their journey you know and, and it is a journey because yeah. y y you're always going to learn new things and and to me this is also exciting this is why i'm of an course. educator and yeah, an academic yeah, yeah. i i love to learn yeah um and so so i think that's a little bit different today where as 30 years ago it was much much more difficult, difficult. thank you I all think right. I think all our viewers will enjoy it very much. Uh, if they have any questions, especially about the fund, if they are non-US professional investors, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's sort of an interesting uh, twist. If I may just mm -hmm. add a few uh, comments, is that so? Um, you know, because the US have actually created restrictions around the world in terms of how you can open a yeah, bank uh, account and and who can be in a fund, etc. The reason why we don't take uh, uh, U.S. citizens into our fund is that if we do that, we then have to basically expose every investor in the fund to U.S. Uh, uh, rules. Yeah, and and we just say then it's easier for us not to have U.S. Um, okay, uh, um, customer. Okay. So it's nothing against uh, Americans. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but you sort of have done it to yourself. <laughs> So All right, so I'll put the link also below for if they have any questions. Yeah, if they have any questions, I'll be very happy uh, to, uh, to talk with people and, and, um, and answer them. Uh, well, thank you for doing this. I'm sure they will enjoy it. And I'll see you next month in Malaysia at the Investor Conference. Yep, we'll be happy to see you there. Great. Thank you, Per. Cheers.